everybody. Let's thank the Lord. Come on. Yeah. We believe that Jesus rose again from the dead 2,000 years ago. Because he rose, you can rise. And that's the truth of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is him risen from the dead. And that is the beauty of what we're doing here today. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, our faith is, means nothing. Everything rises and falls on Jesus rising from the dead. So I have good news for you today. He is not in a tomb. He's risen. Amen? But well, we're talking about graves to gardens, and, and I just wanted to, um, to share with you an illustration of what would happen if you were to get something in the mail, uh, certified mail, and you open it up, and it's got the Hammer and Law Associates. It's a nice, thick envelope. You open it up, and the law office is telling you that you've been bequeathed $5 million from your long-lost second cousin who passed away and left you his estate. Now, what would you do if that opened up? You probably go, this is another scam. It's like one of the, how many of you ever get those phone calls? Your vehicle warranty has expired. Yeah. How about, how, how about this one? I'm a, I, used to, I used to get emails from Kenya, Africa, saying, oh, my husband died, oh, pastor, and I need to transfer a million dollars. Can I put it through your bank account? And you know, all these scams out there, right? But if I got a, a lawyer's letter with, on stationery that said that, from Uncle Charlie? Uh, I think I would, uh, first of all, find if I have Uncle Charlie. Second of all, I would look into it, right? I mean, do you think your life might change with $5 million? Absolutely. But do you realize the Bible says, what does it profit a man or woman if they gain the whole, whole world and lose their own soul? And so as wonderful as that would be to get $5 million from an inheritance, what we have to offer today is Jesus Christ. Not only is it a great life now where you can leave your past behind and understand why you're alive, as good as that is, but also he promises you a new heaven and a new earth that one day will have perfect bodies. One day there'll be no more suffering. You'll be with Jesus forever doing the most amazing things possible with the people you love. Now, I can't think of anything greater than that. And that's what Jesus offers us by dying on the cross, that we could be with him. You see, and, and I just wanted to share with you a little bit of a story. I'm not quite sure where you are or what you know or what you don't know, and that's okay. But the Jewish people were God's instrument that he used to bring salvation to the world. He started with a test pattern, and he started with a people group. And eventually, from Abram, they went all the way to Abraham, and then they were in captivity for over 430 years in Egypt. God raised up a deliverer to take them out of bondage. And eventually, they began their own kingdom. They had a series of kings, and they were a beautiful empire, and they had a tremendous monarchy that was taking place, and, and it was wonderful, but it all fell apart, and they lost everything. And for years, and, and seven, eight hundred years, this prophesied over a thousand years that God is going to raise up a new Messiah to usher in a new kingdom better than the glory days. And so the Jewish people were believing for this. Prophesied by Moses, prophesied by Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And so what happened by this point, the Jewish people were on subjection of the Roman Empire, and, and they were in Jerusalem, and they built them a temple, but they, they had to pay more taxes. They had no rights. They were like serfs. They were lower-class citizens. There was tremendous racism taking place, and these were the people that were suffering, waiting for the Messiah. I, I don't know where you are today, but maybe you feel like you're in the second-class citizen. Maybe you had a dream that was smashed. But what happened was this. They had messiahs come and claiming that I am the Christ, but they would die. And either you follow that messiah or you find a new one. Finally, a baby was born in Bethlehem to a poor peasant family. His name was Jesus. And from a, from a nowhere place, from, from a nowhere parents, he grew up until he was 30. In fact, uh, my last name is Bucci, which is Italian. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and uh, some people think that uh, Jesus was Italian. I don't know if you realize this. The reason being is he, he stayed at home until he was 30. <laughs> he, 
He took over the family business, and his mother thought he was God. Okay, can we have a little fun in church, everybody? Okay, thank you. I'm like, oh, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> so Jesus grew up, right? And at 30 years old, when rabbis go into the ministry, Jesus began his ministry for three and a half years. What he did was astounding. He healed the sick. He walked on water. I mean, he did incredible things, raised people from the dead. And what happened was the religious leaders of his day did not like who he was, and they didn't like because he was stealing their power from them because they had their world figured out. Maybe your world is figured out. Maybe my world is figured out, and we don't want it to change. And this is what happened to the religious leaders. And then his disciples began to grow from 12 to 120 to 500. He'd have thousands. Thousands of people, 5,000 men, not including women and children. Some people guesstimate up to 15 to 20,000 people would listen to him speak. His popularity was rising higher and higher and higher and higher. And the religious leaders were losing their grip of power. And they didn't want to lose their grip of power. They want to control their lives. They don't want anyone telling what to do. Why? Because they had their idea of who God was. They had their idea of how the Messiah was going to come. And if you mess with my God, I'll crucify your God. But they're crucifying their own God. Maybe we're doing the same today. Could it be we're thinking that Jesus has to do this, 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 and the other, and he doesn't? Then I'm going to crucify my Lord. And so this is what happened. So what do they do? They trumped up false charges. They arrested him at night, had secret trials, and by 9 o'clock in the morning, no one even knew what was going on. It was too, it was too late. He was crucified on the cross. And at 3 o'clock, he let out his left breath. It is finished. It is finished. And right there, the disciples, his 12 closest friends, and one betrayed him. Actually, two betrayed him. One killed himself because he was so ought about it. Maybe you've blown it so much that you feel you can't go on anymore. That's not God's plan for you. Or maybe you're feeling like, I, I blew it so much. So basically what happened was this. These disciples thought they were on the ground floor. The ground floor of a new startup, if you will. A startup of a new kingdom. And they had their hopes built up on Jesus. They thought this was it. They thought God is going to do X, Y, and Z. God is going to give me that new job. I'm going I'm to move across the country. I'm going I'm to get free of the situation. And, and, and all of this fell to nothing. Everything was dashed. Their, their life became a grave. And they didn't believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. They didn't because what's so interesting is his adversaries knew what he said. His adversaries said, well, we know what he said. He said he's going to raise again three days from the dead, so this is what we need to do. We need to seal that tomb for three days and put Roman guards and ask Pilate for it. But his own disciples did not know it. Why? Because his disciples were so, quote-unquote, hell-bent on seeing the kingdom of God happen the way they wanted it. Some believe that Judas of Iscariot wanted Christ to be the conquering king right now. And since he didn't meet the expectation, he betrayed him. But all the disciples were pretty much the same way. You know, you have to understand, there were, the, the disciples were rejects. They were. They, they, were they, they basically flunked out of rabbi school. They were not good enough to be picked. The highest echelon of society were the rabbis. And so here are these disciples. Jesus has not picked the Ivy League Tower, he picks lowlifes, people like tax collectors, which were the scum of the earth. They were seen as double crossers, horrible. He picked all these, he picked women back in that day to help support his ministry. They would follow him around. In fact, all this happened. And then all their hopes were dashed to the rocks. Death of a dream. Maybe that's you today. Maybe, maybe you lost a marriage or two. Maybe a lost relationship with your parents or your own children. Maybe you have a debilitating disease that no one knows about that you're suffering. Maybe you have a debilitating uh, propensity for, for whatever it is. Maybe you have something, if anyone ever knew what you really did in secret, no, not even your spouse would accept you, your friends wouldn't accept you, no one would. You're shameful of what you're like, and you know that you've blown it, and you can never be restored to where you once thought you might be. It's over. I'm just going to sit in coach. I, I can't be in first class anymore. I've lost it. Maybe that's you. Maybe the hope is gone. Maybe you thought, maybe by this time in my life, by this time, I should be here. And look where I am. I have no family. I have no money. Maybe you're at the point of retirement. 
Maybe I lost a spouse and you're all alone. You're like, what's next for me, God? Why am I even alive? Everyone else getting to the college they want to, and I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm depressed. I'm gone. Well, there was a woman on the first day of the week named Mary Magdalene. You see what happened? Jesus died on the cross on a Friday. He took him off the cross before sunset, before Passover. They wrapped him in these expensive linen cloths to put, put spices on him, but they could not complete the embalming process because they're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. So Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man, put him, Jesus, in a tomb. They sealed the tomb. Now it's Sunday morning, and now we pick up the story with Mary Magdalene. Okay? So on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. And let me just explain who Mary Magdalene is. Magdalene is to where she's from. It's like saying Eric from Cheshire or Joey from Vegas. If you know Joey from Vegas, he's probably not a good guy, right? Hey, I'll, take, I'll call my friend Joey from Vegas. So here's a guy in Vegas. Well, Magdalene was a bad area. It was, it was known to be a place of ill repute, a place not a place where you want someone to be. And, and Mary Magdalene was not what you call in the higher echelon of society. In fact, it says in the Bible that she was seven demons were cast out of her in Luke chapter 8, verse 7. Seven demons were cast out of her. And so what demons are, there are these spiritual entities that will come into you. We can see in Mark chapter 5, a demoniac who is out of his mind, talking to himself, cutting himself. You, no one can restrain him. He was basically out of his mind. So whatever your belief system is, she was out of her mind. She was stark lunatic. She was crazy. She had seven demons. And Jesus saw her, and he prayed for her, and he cast her out seven demons also some church tradition believes you she was a prostitute coming from that area so here you have a low-life jewish woman that was crazy came from a bad side of town most likely a prostitute now if you and i were like forget that one but what did jesus do he chose her she began to follow him with a bunch of other women you know, what I find so interesting about Jesus raising from the dead, because if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, it's the earliest, one of the earliest writings we have, only 20 years after Christ rose again from the dead, he says, you can ask people that we, they're alive today and see that he rose again from the dead. And that, there, I mean, there's no, no one in history that has the amount of verification of Christ raising from the dead. And, and perhaps the most baffling one is Mary Magdalene. Because she is one of the first people to see Jesus, and it doesn't make any sense. If you're going to make up a false religion, you want to have proof text. You want to do things that make you look good. But the Bible talks about these people that are nobodies, and they're the ones that testify about Jesus. What credibility does Mary Magdalene have? Women had no credibility in that day at all, especially a crazy woman that was a prostitute. What right would she have in a court of law? None. So why would the first person to see the risen Christ be a woman if you want to make up a false religion? If you want to, if you want to kind of, you know, pad the story a little bit, make it make, it make sense. It doesn't make sense. It, it actually hurts your story. And that's what the situation was. So on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. The stone had been taken away from the tomb. She's like freaking out. What happened? So she ran and went to Simon Peter, one of the disciples, and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, <laughs> that's John who wrote the book, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Notice, she didn't say he rose again from the dead. You have to understand, no one's ever done that before. No, no, no Messiah has ever risen from the dead. So they're thinking, they're, they're gone. And all she's holding on to is the memory of yesterday. Maybe that's you. Maybe you have a dead corpse of what used to be. And you look at it and you say, oh, I wish I could be back in those days again. You can never go back. You don't want to go forward. And what did she do? She ran and told the disciples. And so what did the disciples do? They had taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. Why do guys always compete? <laughs> Just the other day, I was at a stoplight, and this truck was running with a Hemi engine. I, 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 
I raced him for about 40 miles and I stopped. And he went forward and he got pulled over, praise the Lord. <laughs> both of them were running together. That was you, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So he's faster than the other guy. And stooping in, he saw, which is the Greek word blepo, the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him. He's the kind of guy that goes bungee jumping. He does anything, right? And he went into the tomb, and he saw different Greek word. This Greek word means he investigated. He was wondering what happened. He saw the linen cloths lying there. He was baffled. And then the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. In other words, Jesus makes his bed. That's for somebody out there today. <laughs> now, why does it keep him talking about the linen cloths? Because the linen cloths are worth a lot of money. It doesn't make sense to steal the body and leave the glute. If someone steals your wallet or purse and they empty out your credit cards, all your goods, and and they leave it on the, on the car seat, and all they take is the purse. Who cares? Unless, well, some of you ladies have $10,000 purses. Imagine, I mean, your wallet's left behind, and, and, they, and then they take your wallet and they leave all the loot. Why would you do that? Why would you steal a body and leave the most valuable things behind? doesn't make any sense. So that's what happened. Fold up in place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. Again, we're being told he won the race. Okay, John, we get it also went in, and he saw and believed because he was like a cocoon. He saw it believed. It was convincing to him. For as of yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So right now, no one has seen him. They just saw the evidence. So the disciples run away. Mary is still distraught. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Even though Jesus rose again from the dead, she did not know it. She was weeping. Her view of God was really small. Could it be that your view of Jesus is mighty small? As she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, check this out. And she saw two angels. I mean, she was so distraught, she didn't care about the angels. Angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, at one at the head and the other at the other at his feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She's holding on to the past. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. You know, there was two other men that were his disciples, not the core they were walking to a city, by the, a town by the Emmaus, and they were walking along. Another person joined them. They were talking about all the things that happened and how, how their hopes were dashed to the rocks. And this man joins them, and they're so distraught, so much looking at their pain, so much looking at their discomfort, and so much looking, almost texting their, texting their problems. They don't even know where they're driving. And they get to a place, and, and the man said, and the man breaks the bread, and they realize it was Jesus, and he disappeared. Sometimes Jesus is in the middle of your pain and you're not even aware of it because you're looking at the pain instead of the gain that he wants to give you through his presence and his promise. So she turned around and saw Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Actually, he didn't say it that way. He said, woman, why are you weeping? Jesus knew exactly why she was weeping. But Jesus cares about your feelings, even if they don't make sense. A lesson for parents and husbands to wives even if you think your spouse's emotions make no, no sense at all, listen. Ask questions. Draw out. Shows that you care. Jesus cared. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking, supposing him to be the gardener? Maybe that's you today. You think God's left you, but I believe right now Jesus is walking through this place in his spirit. He's real close to you. He wants to know you. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. He said her name, Mary. You know, my father grew up in an orphanage all his life, was told he was nothing. No one ever told my dad he was loved. One day he was in a church service. He got called forward, and he had a, he had a visitation with Jesus. He's 86 years old, never had something like this again. But he heard 
David. God called my father's David. I love you. I'm Jesus. My dad had an experience where God called his name. Here we have Jesus calling Mary. Jesus wants to call you by name. He wants to call you by name. He wants to call you by name. Your identity is wrapped up in your most intimate relationships. Your father gives you your identity. This world today says this. You are what you think you are. Claim your identity. Be strong in your identity. And look how crooked and look how messed up our culture is because we've lost our identity. Our identity is found in God, our creator. He's the one that puts you together. He's the one that knits you in your mother's womb. He knows you. He calls you by name and says, John, he says, Rich, he says, David, he says, I love you. And Jesus is calling your name right now. He's calling your name right now, Terry. He's calling your right now, name, Guy. He's calling you right now. And he's saying to you, I love you. She turned and said to him in her Aramaic, Rabboni, she knew your identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Okay, this, is, this blows me away. She was like, the Greek word is like for pinching. Now, this is amazing. Jesus arose again from the dead, okay? He didn't even go to heaven yet to meet with the Father. But he stopped before he took off. Because he saw a destitute woman who he loved and who he cared about. He cared enough to stop, to spend time with her. To comfort her. And I believe right now Jesus is here and wants to comfort you. Even look at me and look on the camera. Even you at home, wherever you're located, God loves you. He's calling your name. That's what he's doing. But go to my brothers, he said to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And by the way, later on, Thomas says, my Lord and my God, Jesus is God. Jesus is calling to you. He wants to call you by name. He wants to turn your graves into gardens, and that's what he wants to do today. And so this is the story that we see. Now, why did Jesus come to the earth in the first place? Why? Because he loves us. The first, your first parents were in a garden. The Bible says by, by one man came sin. Basically, Adam and Eve represent what you and I would have done the same thing. By one man, sin entered the planet, and by one man, redemption, Jesus, the second Adam. If you put your faith in him, we break the curse of the old Adam. And this is what Jesus has done for us. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed, whoever, doesn't make a difference what you've done, what your past is. Even if you're told you're a loser, even if you've been through many difficulties, you've been through all sorts of things you're ashamed of, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everybody. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. If he wanted to condemn it, you'd be dead already. The reason why you are alive is that Jesus is walking in the grave of your life and he's stretching his hand and he wants to call you by name. He wants you to get your head out of your problems, head out of your past, and he wants you to look at him and accept he's calling you by name. For God did not send his son into the, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Tim Keller, one of my favorite writers and preachers, says this so good. The gospel is this. We're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at this very same time, we're more loved and more accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared to hold. All your life, you've been trying to measure up. Is this enough? If I get that promotion, if I get that job, if I get that money, then I will. Then I will. All your life, then I will. Maybe when I retire, maybe when I get out of the house, maybe when I have a boyfriend or girlfriend, maybe when I get married, maybe when I have kids, maybe one day, one day, one day, and you get there, you're not there. You see, Jesus is everything you are looking for. This is the issue. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. 
There's not one that's righteous. There's not one that does right. All of us are full of sin. For the wages of sin is death, everybody. You can see what's going on in the world. A godless world does godless things. But the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, we weren't even looking for him, Jesus died and paid your way already. Imagine if there was a ship that was going to go to England from New York Harbor and he gave you the ticket and you have the ticket and you need to go. You have the ticket, but you don't receive the ticket until you get on board the vessel and stay on the vessel. Jesus is our transportation to God. He is our covering. There's no one can come to the Father except through him. He said this. This is Jesus. He says, I am, which actually says, I am God. I am the way. You don't know the way? Jesus knows the way. Why does he know the way? He's not a way. He's not a way. He's the only way. People say, well, I have my truth. You have your truth. There's no such thing as that. It's either truth or it's false. Jesus does not give truth. He is the truth. And he is Zoe. He is life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not through Buddha. Not through Muhammad's teachings, through Islam. Not through any Hinduism, no other ism will bring you to God. There's only one way a man or woman can be saved is through Jesus Christ. Well, that's so narrow-minded. That's so narrow, and that's not narrow-minded at all. There's truth and there's false. But what about all the people in India? And what about the animists in different countries? I mean, what kind of God is going to send them to hell? I don't know what, how that's going to work out, but this is what I do know. Every person has to go through Jesus, and Jesus makes the determination. And so the only assurance of going to heaven and being with God forever is through Jesus Christ. There's salvation and no other name for which a man and woman can be saved until Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, Amen. repent. You're on the wrong path, everybody. And return to your maker that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And there's nothing greater in my life than spending time with the Lord, than knowing that I am loved by him and that the best days are ahead for me in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment as I pray for you. Father, I pray right now for everyone in this room and everyone watching online. Lord, I ask that they would come to know you as their Savior and as their Lord. And Lord, for other believers that have fallen away, have been Mary Magdalene's, that have lost their way and made bad decisions and bad situations, I pray they'd come back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you guys, just could, we want to conclude our time today with a couple more things. It's a spiritual survey. If you want to pull that card out, on the bottom there's four boxes. I'm going to ask you to be honest with me today and honest with yourself. If you've, I'm going to ask everyone if you could be so kind to pull it out and mark it. If I have already put my trust on Jesus, you already are a believer, you gave him life to Christ. If that's you, please check A. Maybe you're B. I'm beginning to trust on Jesus today. You know what? I want to give my life to Christ. I was walked away. I want to get right with him. Or this is my first time. I now understand what it's about. You want to check B. Or maybe you're C, where I was for over a year. I'd like to consider a bit more first. I, I have some questions, and we are okay with questions. We're not afraid of questions. Truth can handle any inquiry. I'm so confident in who Christ is. And maybe you're D. I hope no one is. I don't ever intend to make this decision. If you just take a moment to fill that card out, one of those boxes. I want to pray a prayer with you. If, you wanna, if, you're, if you're either B or maybe you're C, ready for B? I'm going to ask you one more time to pray this prayer with me. You know, bow your heads or close your eyes and, and repeat after me in your own heart. It, it's not the prayer, it's your heart connected to God. Say, Lord Jesus, that's right, in your own way. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I put my trust in you 
I step down from being in charge of my life. I declare my life is not yours. I surrender to you. I surrender my life right now to you. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.